Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today we have Wendy Sterling back with us. I'm so happy. You all remember Wendy from one of the first episodes. Wendy, we just passed 100 episodes. You were like episode, I think, number three or four, um, why divorce rehab may just be the kick in the ass that you, that you need. Um, and it's about time we had you back. So I'm so thrilled you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm excited to be back. It's, I mean, so much has happened. It's been not quite two years since we launched, uh, divorce and beyond. And, you know, in that period of time, I know you have added programs and been been adding coaching and all kinds of things to what you're doing. Let me remind my listeners of your amazing background. Um, Wendy is one of my favorite things, the top divorce media personality. I love that, that, that title. (laughs) I struggle at times to come up with like, what do we do? Right. (laughs) So, um, but you're also, you work internationally as a divorce coach, very important life transition specialist, which face it, divorce is one of those biggest transitions. And as I just referenced the founder of the divorce rehab and Wendy has her own podcast, the divorce women's guide. Um, so I'll, I'll link to the podcast as well. And I urge you all to go listen to it. She has some amazing guests and some fantastic episodes where Wendy is there to give you guidance and advice much as she's going to do today. And we were just talking a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today, because as you mentioned, as a coach and as someone who's helping people all the time, and and I find the same thing, co-parenting is just the, the quicksand of divorce. It's the, you, you can never get away from it. You put your foot in and you sink and it's just a constant struggle for so many people. So we're going to talk about some of your top tips for um, a smoother co-parenting experience, but let's talk about where this all comes from for you, because I know you've had some of your own issues with this, and it's always helpful to my listeners to hear that other people have gone through what they're going through and have come out on the other side, got out of that, that quicksand. So can you share a little bit about what happened for you with this journey? Yeah, of course. And I love sharing my story because while we all have our own, I think that there's always pieces of it that are completely relatable and at least let people know that they're not alone. So most importantly, I do believe that divorce can be the most empowering experience that we go through to find our true identity and voice so that we can start designing a life that we love instead of feeling stuck with the one that we have. And that was very much me. I was married for about 16 years, we have two beautiful children, two boys. And it was one of those moments where out of nowhere, the universe punched me in the gut when, uh, you know, one night when my now ex-husband and I were coming home from a couple's night out. And I realized that the life that I had thought I had created, or the one I call now my Facebook facade life, uh, was in fact anything but that. And so it was in that moment that I knew that the life that I had created with him was no longer the life that I believed we had. And so uh, it was in that moment where I knew that it was time for me to start taking a stand for myself, to start using my voice and my identity, the problem was, was that I didn't know, I didn't know what it was. I I knew who I was. I worked in corporate for almost 20 years. I knew who I was as a manager, as a leader, as a revenue driver. I knew who I was as a mom. I knew who I was as a daughter, a sister, all these other areas of my life. And yet when I looked at myself in the mirror, I had no idea who Wendy was. And it really took my divorce to wake me up. I say that, you know, I got woken up by a two by four smack across the face from the universe um, for me to really start standing in my power. And so it was in that moment that I decided to take a stand for myself. Um, I 
stumbled upon the world of life coaching through a Facebook friends post. I was in therapy. I read every self-help book. I was listening to your podcast back in the day at the time. Um, you know, I, I was getting my hands on any free anything. And what I realized was that nothing was really pushing me into getting unstuck and pushing me forward in, in any momentum whatsoever. I was stuck in my limiting belief thoughts. And so once I found life coaching, you know, I'm a go big or go home kind of gal. So for me, it wasn't just signing up to learn how to be a life coach. It was hiring a life coach and just going full in. And through that whole process, I, you know, thankfully I was smart and I documented my entire emotional recovery because I noticed how much more quickly I was moving through the emotional trauma um, of the infidelity in my marriage much more quickly with coaching than I was with my own therapist. Um, and don't get me wrong. I love therapy and it helped me in a million other ways, but yeah. where I was, I really needed a, I needed a push forward. And so, um, I realized that there was something unique and special, um, to this. And so not only did I decide to file for divorce, I also decided to leave my cushy six figure paycheck and my 20 year career, um, which, you know, I'm not saying I recommend for everybody, but it was just something I knew I got to do. It was it, all the signs were there. And so that's really how divorce rehab came to be. It was really created through my own process, my own journey. Um, it integrates in multiple modalities of healing, not just life coaching, but spiritual psychology, theta healing. I'm also a certified divorce specialist. So all these different modalities come in and are woven into my five-step proprietary program, which is what the divorce rehab is. And so I feel really grateful for the work that I get to do because as you know, and as I've said, since the day we met, you know, my divorce truly was a gift and it happened for me not to me. And so the fact that I get to empower women every single day to see their divorce as the best gift that's ever happened for them is truly just one of the most amazing things. And that my vision for the world, my vision for the legacy that I'm looking to leave in this world is really to change the stigma around divorce, to be one of empowerment instead of shame. So, you know, here I am standing on the other side. Um, you know, I will tell your listeners to kind of tee up this episode too, is that my ex-husband and I, we had a very tumultuous divorce. It was not pretty for the first couple of years. Um, and I will tell you that I am standing here now over five years later, and we are better friends now than we were our last few years of marriage. So that's, that's how far I've come in my relationship with him and how great we are now as co-parents. Well, that's right there. Uh, you know, that is what my listeners always resonate with is, you know, for those of you who are watching the video, you can see we have a woman here who is in a place you can just tell when you look at some people in a place of harmony in their lives. And that includes that very tricky co-parenting paradigm, right? Um, you know, there's just nothing else really like it. This, this concept of continuing to raise little human beings with a person that you're no longer married to, but have a very complicated emotional history and maybe financial history and all kinds of things with it is complicated. And, you know, what you, you know, what we're going to talk about today and sort of dive into is you've got some great insights into maybe not how to uncomplicate it, but how to get through it and get to that place like you are today. I love that analogy or that, that I concept of being better friends or in a better place with your ex than you were in the last few years of your marriage. So this is going to help all the people out there that you and I hear from all the time, like my co, you know, my co-parents making me cry crazy. Yes. Um, you know, one of the things I thought I wanted to start with, with this though, is that term co-parent or co-parenting, yes. right? Because we use it all the time. I'm co-parenting, talk to your co-parent. What's the difference between co-parenting and a parent and just parenting? What's co-parenting? Yeah. So I get this question a lot and, you know, and, and I think people, so badly want to be co-parents, right? And they think that it has to look one way when it doesn't. Uh, it gets to look 
any which way you get to create it. And I'm happy to share sort of what I have broken down co-parenting to be. Ultimately, it is a method by which you and your co-parent are working together to raise your children. Now, co-parenting and raising your children together does not always, I think people hear that as, well, we have to have the same rules. We have to do the same things. It has to, what's at my house has to be at their house. And ultimately that is not what raising your kids together means. Um, you know, sure, co-parenting does require communication. It does require flexibility. It does require the willingness of both parents to compromise when and if necessary. And I think that what people don't understand is that there is a wide spectrum of what co-parenting gets to look like. And on one side of that spectrum is what we call parallel parenting. And so many times people think that parallel parenting is the worst thing that you could ever do. And oh my God, that means that I don't know what's going on at the other house. If they're doing whatever it is that they want. And here's the thing, you guys, is that what is more important, your children being raised in a, in a home where their parents are getting along, and maybe that means two sets of rules in two separate houses, or do you want your kids to be raised in houses where you both are coming at each other 24-7 and you're exposing them to drama and, and arguments and negative energy all the time. And so what I always tell my clients and what I always preach is that just because you may be parallel parenting in the beginning, which I did, we were parallel parents for a very long time, which was really hard for you, all those fellow type A control freak personalities out there like me, okay? It's so hard because we want to control everything, especially those of us who were in charge when you were married, right? You set the rules. You were the one really guiding how the kids were being raised. And so now you're pulled into this position or pushed into this position where it's like, oh my God, I don't have my kids 50% of the time or 30% of the time or whatever it is. And so what I always remind my clients is that parallel parenting is a great solution it, and it doesn't have to be a long-term one. What, what's wrong with it just being a short-term solution? So parallel parenting means that each parent does have their own independent parenting style and rules when the kids are with them. And yes, it means that things are kept separate. And sometimes, you know, again, there's a spectrum of what parallel parenting gets to look like, right? Um, but at the, at the, what I always try to let people know is that if that is the best way for your kids to thrive, then please put your kids in the center and do what is best for them. Now, benefits, right? There's benefits to both. Benefits of co-parenting mean reducing conflict for your kids. It's, yes, it's increased stability of shared routines and rules in each of the households. It also facilitates stronger communication between the two co-parents, right? But there's also benefits to co-parent, excuse me, to parallel parenting as well. What parallel parenting is, is promoting are very similar things, right? It's minimizing the conflict. Like the same benefits that I just mentioned to co-parenting do apply to parallel parenting because at the end of the day, you just want your kids to not feel the tension between you and your co-parent, right? Yeah. So conflict is greatly reduced when you parallel parent. That is because you are limiting your contact with one another, right? It means that you're putting your kids first. And one of my other favorite topics, Susan, that you know I love talking about is that when you parallel parent, you get to set boundaries and they are communicated to the other co-parent and they're very clear and they're firm yet flexible. Again, compromise does have to happen with both. And I'm here to say there isn't, one isn't better than the other. It's what works for you. And for a very long time, I parallel parented and we, and my, oh my gosh, my ex-husband was like, we need to co-parent. We need to go see a co-parenting expert. And I was like, dude, put on the brakes. We are like, I do not like you. We are not in that place. I do not want to have anything to do with co-parent. Like that wasn't yeah. even a word. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, and I'm sitting here today where we have an incredible co-parenting relationship, but we parallel parented for about two to three years. And my kids are amazing. They're doing great. They're thriving. You know, it was the best choice for them. Well, so, I mean, so much there that I, I just really want to make sure people heard, you know, one, it was the best choice for them. That is always supposed to be what our guiding principle is. It's very hard to do. I know everybody thinks it's easy. It is very hard to do what's best for the kids. And often you and your ex are going to disagree on what is best for the kids. That's part of this whole paradigm. But you know, my, my listeners have heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. The amount of conflict between their parents is the number one predictor for children having issues arising out of a divorce the conflict between the two of you. And that's whether you are fighting over them or you are fighting over whether it's Tuesday or whatever, it's just that level of conflict. So I am so, you know, I just love that you point out that, you know, at that one end of the spectrum, if parallel parenting is going to reduce the conflict, what's wrong with that? Right. And it doesn't. And the other thing is that it doesn't have to be forever. Everybody looks at these decisions or these these moments in time as if this is the rest of everybody's lives. And frankly, we should all know better than that. Has your life at any I don't even want to say how old I am, but let me tell you, it is not the same life I had one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Think about that. Right. Things are going to change. And maybe by reducing the conflict, that's going to start the healing and the change. hundred percent, hundred percent. And and it's another really important, I, there's so much that you just said. I'm like, so I'm excited by it all. The fact, you know, I hear people talk about parallel parenting all the time. Um, I, I love how you defined it. And then the fact that you're just really, it's an end of a spectrum of co-parenting. You are still raising your children together. It's just together apart, right? You're, you're doing it. And sometimes that really is what's, it may not be perfect, but if it's reducing that conflict, it is generally what's best for your children. Children who go into a tornado in, of emotion in both houses and who are put in that feeling. And by the way, let's just clear this up for anyone who thinks that you're hiding your conflict from your kids not happening. Your kids know. Kids are little like emotional antenna radar, you know, devices. They know exactly what's going on. So let's talk about some of the common co-parenting mistakes parents make beyond those that we just sort of believing it's yeah. forever and all that. What are some of the other just common, you know, steps into the, the quagmire that we're talking about here? Yeah, and, and this plays into, I want to say one other quick thing, um, if that's okay, that kind of leads us into this, is that most of the mistakes that are made are a result of us showing up in the co-parenting relationship in our default role in our marriage. So, so many times co-parenting is problematic because we automatically default back into being ex-wife of or ex-husband, right? And so part of what is so incredibly important and why, you know, Susan, you did the work, I've done the work, why it's so important for people to do the work is you, you get to know who you are now so that you can identify who it is that you want to be in this relationship. And so until you, you know your identity, which when you co-parent, your identity is mom and dad. You are no longer ex-wife or ex-husband. You are no longer the spouse of, right? You are now mom or dad. And so until you own and step into that mom or dad role in this relationship, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes, again, default you back into what it is that the role that you used to play in, in your marriage. 
And so all the mistakes that people make have to do with the default, right? And so the biggest thing that I want people to understand is that the majority of the mistakes, rather than listing them out, because I know everyone knows what the mistakes are, I want to break down kind of like the thought process behind why you make these mistakes, because this is actually, I'm hoping is going to be very tangible information for your audience to start paying attention and to not do this anymore. So when when your co-parent does something, okay, so call it, you know, a, a, a circumstance, an event, whatever it is, it evokes feelings inside of you, right? So let's say, for example, your ex brought your kids late and you feel enraged because you feel like your time is being completely just ignored, disrespected. Well, what that did was that event of your ex dropping your kids off late triggers these thoughts, right? Which then triggered your feelings, right? You have these thoughts of, wow, how rude, how disrespectful, and I feel angry. And what ends up happening when we default into our ex, you know, or excuse me, our former spouse role is that we become, we go on autopilot of our emotions. So we default back into, well, here we go, like here he does it again, or here she goes again. And so you default into these uh, you know, you kind of autopilot the reactions and the emotions. So we then act upon our feelings, which then causes, right, the next event, which sometimes isn't always the best one, because when we react, right, we're not being thoughtful, we're being emotional. And so our thoughts are immediately negative, right? And so the negative trigger ends up coming into play. And so what I want people to understand is that in order to avoid any of the mistakes that you're making, right? Mistakes like, you know, choosing to react instead of respond where you are, you know, and that's when you get a text and you think that you have to sit there and automatically write somebody back. No, you don't. You get to take a breath and take a minute but your feelings are triggered by what it is that you're thinking, right? Not by what they did. So to get back a little bit of control and to avoid the mistake is to actually change your thoughts. So instead of going, oh, he's always late or oh, she's always late, that's that's your default. Instead of going, wow, um, I hope everything's okay. I wonder if something came up. I want you know. There's all these other perspectives that you can choose that minimize the anxiety that you are choosing to take upon for yourself, right? So you have this window of opportunity to shift what it is that you're thinking, what it is that you're feeling. And so being able to have the tools to break it down and to really see like, what is really real here? Is this my old story, et cetera, will help everybody to avoid any and all mistakes that people make because, you know, you guys know what it is that you're making mistakes on. You know what it is that you're doing. And 90% of them are a result of you reacting emotionally instead of responding from a place of being rational. Yeah. Reacting versus responding is a yes. huge, doesn't sound that different. It's a hugely different thing. And, yes. you know, one point that you make there, I always call it that pause that pause before you respond uh, rather than react because you're much more likely to react if you do that in the spur of the moment, in the heat of the moment, in that emotional space. Give yourself, take a, take a breath, yes. um, a, a true and actual breath. That, you know, I won't go into the neuroscience <laughs> behind that, people, but a couple of deep breaths is going, is going to get you started. And it's so important. I really, I, I love the way that, that you've taken that and taking it away from the focus on, well, he's always late. Well, she tries to control my time with the mm -hmm. kids. Well, you know, this, that, or whatever it is into our, re our reactions and responses mm -hmm. to the, these behaviors. And the fact that, you know, face it, we all have our roles and, and we're very accustomed. That's one of the things yeah. that makes this co-parenting so complicated is that you have established these roles, whether it be mom and dad or mom and mom and dad and dad, or, but you know, you often have, you know, how often do you hear this one? Well, I was always the primary caregiver. I love that legal phrase getting thrown into it, but you know, well, 
Does that mean that the other parent cannot become a caregiver, if that's what we want to call it? If you were always the one taking him to the doctor's appointment, does that mean the other parent can't? You know, things are going to change. And, and you know, so some of what we need to do in establishing and growing a co-parenting relationship is understanding that changes are going to be happening all around. Everybody's going to be changing, including your kids who now live in two homes. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important for people to understand that you, you know, trust me, I wanted to control food. I wanted to control schedules, bedtimes. I mean, you name it. I, and the biggest mistake I made was telling him what he was doing wrong. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> nobody you know, responds to that well no and especially if you're dealing with an ex who has narcissistic characteristics they all they hear is you know static noise and and they'll somehow turn it around and blame you for having created that you know dynamic for them right mm-hmm. and you just get all confused in those circumstances so you know the biggest thing is that you know you you make yourself look worse right? Trying to tell them what to do or making them feel like that doesn't help your kids. You guys, it does not help your kids. And, you know, there's different language that you can use to, I mean, I wanted to help you guys. The ultimate goal is you, you're actually trying to help them, right? You're trying, it's really about helping your kids. So a lot of times I would come from a place of empowering my kids to then have conversations with their dad. Right. And I think we forget and we don't give, you said this earlier, Susan, like we don't give our kids enough credit. Our kids are really resilient and they're super, super smart. And so what I started to do was to empower my kids around like, Hey, you know, you should, you know, cause they, they complain about what was in their lunches. And I'm like, well, have you, have you spoken to your dad about what it is that you like in your lunches? Well, no. Oh, well, why don't, maybe you can go to the market with your dad. Maybe you can tell dad what it is that you like. So he knows what to get. I bet he doesn't know. Like, and it would be so helpful for him if you helped him figure that out. You know, you can help your kids to, and again, this isn't about putting them in the middle, but your kids have to start creating a role for themselves in this other home, right? I did everything. And and now I'm like, no, 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 no. You guys pack your lunches at night. You guys have chores. You guys have this. Like you get to empower your kids in the new dynamics of which they're living into too. Like so much of your co-parenting relationship is also going to depend upon how it is that you empower your kids to use their voice with you and with their co-parent. Yeah. I mean, an amazingly important point right there, because just take that school lunch issue, because I think that is something that so many people run into Think of the difference between you empowering your children to and guiding them into how to have a conversation with their other parent about that, or you going to the other parent and telling them what they're doing wrong and how they should do it better because the kids complained about you and those terrible lunches you make. Let's just think about that for a minute, how those two things are going to set but also take it the step further. If you go rushing in there to fix it for your kids, what did you just teach your kids? Yep. How, is that what they're going to do when they're 25 and their boss tells them to work on the weekend and they don't want to, are they going to call their parent to fix things for them their whole lives to go and fix that? I hopefully not, <laughs> but right. So it's so important that we, we start looking at this and what you've really done is focused on the effect on the children, right. Of this whole paradigm. Um, and there, you know, there are so many different ways this does trickle down to our children. Ultimately, again, that turmoil in the two houses and what, you know, that struggle between two parents on control and all that it's, it's all trickling down to the kids. Yep. You know, I, and so what are some of the ways that you've seen that? manifesting kids? 
Well, are you meaning how does that impact the kids yeah. directly? Yeah. yeah. So, so with it's, it's actually interesting because October happens to also be mental health awareness month. And I actually wrote uh, my newsletter this month has to do with how your mental, or excuse me, how divorce impacts kids and their mental health. And it's so incredibly important. Um, you know, the first thing I will say is that, you know, you guys have to remember that if you're here, if you are communicating information that's happening at the other parent's house, do you not think your co-parent knows who's the deliverer of that information? So your kids may, there may be fallout for your kids if you go back and start talking to the other parent about things that are happening at the house, right? So imagine the, the dynamic you're creating at the other house for your kids when you basically are tattletaling. Like, let's be honest, it's kind of tattletaling, right? Exactly what it is. And so avoiding that for your kids, like you're putting more pressure on them. What I always tell my clients is that use this as, as an opportunity to connect with your kid, use it as an opportunity to empower them, right? Like I gave the lunch example. There's also been times where they have confided in me, you know, things that they don't like that happen at the other house. Like, you know, for your listeners, my ex-husband is now remarried. He has a daughter with his new wife. My kids have a half sister. There have been a lot of new everything happening in that house that my kids have come to me and have you know, complained and cried and all of this. And so it's important for you guys, first and foremost, is to listen to your kids. We, we want to go back into fix it mode, right? We just want, we want to fix it for our kids so bad. And, and that's where helicopter parenting is no bueno, right? <laughs> so it's really about giving your kids holding space for their feelings. I understand you want to fix it. The best way you can fix it is to listen. Just listen and be curious about their feelings. Don't say, oh, I can't believe that, you know, they did that again. Or, you know, just say, well, how did that make you feel? Have you communicated that to mom or dad? What did they say to you? How have you, commu how can I support you with this? You know, and, and there were times even where, you know, early on in our divorce, my kids did go to therapy, huge proponent of it for your kids to have a third party. And there were times where I would say, like, I think the therapist can help you talk to dad, like bring in a third party if that's something that your kids need for you guys to work this through. But ultimately, what's so important for your kids' mental health is for them to just feel heard by at least one of you. It doesn't have to be both. It doesn't have to be the same, but to be the parent that your kids know that they can rely upon. Um, first and foremost, secondly, do not fight with your other, with your co-parent in front of your children. Do not walk away. Just walk away. There's some great one-liners that you can say if they, if they, if they start a conversation that you know is not going to go anywhere, you can say, you know what, I think we should talk about this when so-and-so kids are not around. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about this. Not today. Can we, can we pick another time that's going to work better for us? Um, having the power to, to not engage you guys, it, it's, it's not healthy for your kids when you are engaging in a heated conversation when they are around it, you know, again, it's, it's about choosing to respond instead of, instead of react, um, the last thing I will tell you guys is, you know, watch your words when you're talking about the other parent, right? It's not just about not arguing in front of them, but it's really about paying attention to how it is that you speak and listening to your tone. Again, kids are really smart, guys. They're really intelligent and they can read between the lines. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, our kids sometimes do also is they bait us, right? They'll bait us because they think we want to hear something. They think that, that like, I'm going to like them more if, if they tell me that they don't like their stepmom, you know, right. and a lot of times what I will do is I will say to them, you know, if I, if I sense that there's, they're being unkind or they're being disrespectful, don't get me wrong. I don't have to love their stepmom. It doesn't matter if I like her or not. But what's important to me is not that she's 
you know, she's good to them, but that my kids are respectful, right? So you get to show your co-parent respect and kindness too. When your kids are being disrespectful or they're being unkind, you get to express to them that that's not okay to say that about their dad or that to say that about their mom. Is, is being the example of what kindness and respect look like, because again, it's going to go a long way. You're raising these kids not to hate their co-parent. You're raising them to be amazing adults in this world who know how to handle difficult situations. And sometimes that is going to be with their other parent. And sometimes, like you said, it's going to be with a colleague at work. So keep in mind that every Every interaction with your kids, every interaction with your co-parent is a learning opportunity for you and for your kids. You're so good at this. That is just, (laughs) you're so good at this. (laughs) I wish you had been around in my early days of stepmothering, but you know, it's, it's just so true, right? These It's the thing that I think we as humans, you know, for so many parents, there's fear around losing our children, losing time with them, losing their love and affection. Children have limitless, there's not a, a, yes, there's not like this little pool. And if they give a trickle over to their other parent, you got less. Um, and so, you know, I just think that's really so very important what you were just saying. And and I love, I just love it. It's, it's as always, you drop the verbal golden nuggets for my listeners. Um, and I want them all to know because we, um, timed this episode so that it would come out because you have a very exciting free summit coming up. Can you tell everybody about that? Yeah, absolutely. I am going to be, you know, Susan, you know, I am like this the is queen of be, summit. Yes, <laughs> the summit queen. It's summit number eight. Um, it's actually going to be a live event. And I'm doing it a little bit differently this time, um, as I always try to change it up. But the thing that stays the same is that it's free. Um, you guys can go to coparentingsummit.com to register. I have, I'm going to be joined by five other co parenting experts who are going to be talking about a lot of what. Uh, some of what we talked about today, it's going to, we're going to talk about how, you know, how to introduce new partners. We're going to be talking about how to co-parent with a narcissist. We are going to be talking about how to stand in your new identity. I'm going to be talking about how to set boundaries with your co-parent. And it's going to be, it's going to be great in that we're going to have a Q and a, right. It's going to be about a 20, 25 minutes with me interviewing and, and asking questions that I'm actually going to be asking the audience to send to me, what are the questions you want answered? And the second half of the hour, we're going to allow you guys to ask your questions. So you will have access to every single expert that is going to be in attendance and you will have the opportunity on zoom to ask them your questions live. And so we are going to be doing this. It's on October 22nd. It's a Friday. We start at 8 30 AM Pacific, 10 30 central, 11 30 Eastern time. And what I'm also going to be talking about, and it's so funny, Susan, because you mentioned the name of my new course, like, like without even knowing Uh, what it is. Um, But I'm also going to be sharing for those of you who are going to be in attendance, I am actually launching um, a co-parenting course. And my co-parenting course is actually called Co-Parenting Apart. And so um, for everybody who registers for the summit, you guys are going to get a, a, a an amazing offer to you that day. You're going to get tons of bonuses if if it is something that you guys are interested in. So you're going to want to sign up and join. Again, it's completely free for you guys to attend live. There is an option to get access to the replay as well. So I hope that your listeners come. It's going to be awesome. I have some great people lined up uh, already and you guys can find out who else is going to be there by going to the website, coparentingsummit.com. Well, I will be putting all of that in the show notes and I urge everybody, I mean, Wendy and I can only cover so much in an episode and, you know, she and her experts are true. I mean, you just heard her, right? I mean, don't you want to hear more? Because <laughs> I, I, it's, you know, this is one of those where there are so many valuable little tips. Imagine what an entire summit and frankly, what an entire course would be able to do for you and always 
beyond you, not that we don't love you and want you to be good and healthy and moving forward, but we really want your kids to be good and healthy and moving forward. So Wendy, I'm so thrilled to have you back and thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. You're always so wonderful. Oh, thank you for having me. I love being on and I adore you. So thank you so much. Okay. Everybody go sign up right now for the summit and thank you. Bye everybody. Bye.